something different. Normally the men meet on a Wednesday night, and based on our last meeting, we decided that um, Thursday might actually be a better day for us to meet. So we're going to try it out. So this week we are going to meet on a Thursday night. Um, I think Buddy's still figuring out where to do it. You know, we're, we're kind of we normally either meet in homes or sometimes in a restaurant or sometimes we, we go bowling. Uh, so we will know by tonight uh, exactly what the activity will be. But uh, Thursday night is marked out, and I I just found out based on the slides that the women. Will, uh, will not be meeting this week, so you guys get a break. Um, my wife is in, is in the Philippines, you know, just checking on her dad, and so I'm kind of single and raising three kids on my own. <laughs> it's hard. You know, I, I used to think, um, I used to think that once they're out of diapers and formula and and then all that stuff, it would be easy, and now it's scarier because they have their own cars and you don't know where they are at night, and they're staying up, and uh, I guess that the very thing never ends, I suppose. There's two things going on uh, today that might be good news for you. Number one is, as you notice, my voice is, is not at 100%, and so I, did, I have a lot of teaching to do this week, so I'm going to try to preserve my voice. So this might just be the short sermon you've been praying for. Uh, and I know there's also a game today, so your attention might not be 100%. Uh, I think sometimes when I'm preaching close to like 11.55 and there's a 12 o'clock game, your, your mind's like, go somewhere else. So hopefully we'll be able to prevent uh, those two things today. But, uh, but today I'd like to kind of close out um, a series that I started, really April, that I'm bringing it to today. Um, next week, by the way, does anyone know what next week is next Sunday? Mother's Day. Mother's Day. It's very special. It's, a, it's a, the one Sunday where mothers can, can leverage their power to force children to go to church. Even their old children want to go. And now you go to church for me, for me, for me, please. And churches all across America and the world are filled because mothers simply ask uh, and their children. So we are going to honor them for sure, our mothers. Um, but today I want to close out the, the, the idea of what are the, what are the key characteristics of a disciple? And we talked everything about how a disciple is a person who forgives, is a person who serves, is a person who overcomes uh, trials and difficulty. And we will close it today by saying that a disciple is someone who has a, a desire and a passion to talk about their Savior. So let me read to you from Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 15. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans, he said, For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And today the reminder that the message that we hear week after week, it is a good word. It is good news. It is gospel. And as good news, it is not something simply to be enjoyed. It is, more importantly, something to be shared. And if we, your disciples, have truly been blessed by the message of the gospel, then would you use our life and our lips so that we, in turn, might be messengers of this very message that has made all the difference in our lives. Holy Spirit, guide us and be with us and empower us to live out that which you ask us to obey. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I speak this message, there's one thought I want to begin with, and I want it to kind of stick with you uh, throughout the rest of the message. And the, the, the thought is simple. It's a question. I would like you to think right now of who it was that was responsible for bringing the gospel to you. Who was it that brought the gospel to you? 
Maybe for some of you it was uh, a parent. For some it was an office mate, a friend, a classmate. Maybe even a stranger who just struck a conversation with you. But think of that one person who went out of their way to say, this is who Christ is. And this is the gospel that he asked us to share. And it's simply made an impact in your lives. I realize the question is a little difficult when you consider that in our lives, God brings several people who, who bring that message. And so maybe for you, it's not one individual that brought the gospel to you. It could have been a series of encounters. And each time you encounter someone, you have a, a deeper understanding of what the gospel is. But, but maybe just focus on one person. And then think of, of that person. Have you ever stopped to consider that that person who shared the gospel to you had a choice not to? Maybe they, maybe they were afraid that you wouldn't be open to what you had to say. Maybe they feared criticism. If I, if I share the gospel to this friend of mine, to you, this or that or the other, they might think I'm crazy, they might think I've gone overboard, they might think I'm a fanatic. Maybe there would have been apprehension. What, what will I say? How can I explain it? I don't even understand this fully myself. If you really come to think about it, the person who shared the gospel to you had many reasons not to. And how different would your life be today if they allowed those reasons to get in the way of simply saying, hey, can I say something to you? Can I tell you something? And aren't you glad that that person did it? Aren't you, aren't you so filled with joy? You know, we think of the great people of God, in, even in contemporary history. We think of um, Billy Graham. We think of great preachers. But have you ever stopped to think, who preached to them? Who shared the gospel to these great men and women so that they became the life-changing messengers that they became today? And when you think about it, it really just took off in one person getting out of their comfort zone and saying, God, if you are willing to use me to open somebody's mind and somebody's heart to who you are, then I will take that step. And the reason I share that is <clears throat> I try to even, I wonder very often about the first person I ever shared the gospel to. You know, I, I, my mom was the one who took my brother and I to church, and we heard the gospel in the church for the first time. And so I was 13 years old, and, and so this was very new to me, you know, this whole, I've known about Jesus all my life. I grew up in a church like many of you, but, but the idea that he died for me, that is that was a very personal thing. The idea that I needed to respond to it, that simply being part of an institutional religion was not enough, that, that was new to me. And so there was a sense of relief that, wow, now I'm starting to understand what, what faith and religion was all about. But I also had that, that inner urge to say, well, shouldn't other people know about this? I mean, if it's taken me 13 years, and I grew up in religion, and it's taken me 13 years to come to this realization, um, maybe other people need to know it too. I just didn't know how to communicate that. So I said, Lord, if you want other people to know this, and I was 13, I didn't know what I was doing. I said, but if you want to use me to let other people know about this, then you know, kind of show me. And, and I figured the first person I ought to win to Christ was my best friend, in, and we were in seventh grade at that time. It was my best friend in seventh grade. So um, I figured, okay, that I'm gonna I'm gonna share to Dennis. Whatever happens, I'm going to find a way. Um, so that week in school, we, uh, in, in the school I grew up in, uh, we had monthly confession at the chapel. Hated that. I was always nervous about telling some guy behind a, a screen what, what my sins were. By the way, I have a side story about that. There's nothing to do with my sermon. 
you know, we had, a, we had a really nice high school with a chapel there, and in the, uh, the confessional room, the confessional boss was air conditioned. And, uh, and so, the, for those of you that are not familiar, the, the priest stays in the middle chamber, and then there's a, um, uh, a, a, depending on who you're looking at, right chamber, left chamber. And so we were instructed that, you know, when you, when you enter into one of the chambers and you wait for the, the screen to open before you say anything, and uh, we were kind of high tech in, in that school, and, and so the, the priest reminded us that when you sit on the, in your chamber, the chair triggers the light outside, which shows that somebody is in the chamber. So the, the, the chair shows that it's occupied. So he says, be careful that there's, that, you know, don't play around with that, that's electronic. And every one of my classmates that would enter the chamber, you would see the lights flickering. <laughs> so you all know that we were all doing this, <laughs> testing the system. Uh, and that's my side story. It's nothing to do with this. <laughs> and, and so uh, we did a confession thing. And you know, we all go to the box, and we take our, our seats in the pew until everyone is finished. And so um, Dennis came out of the confessional box, and then he sat down next to me, and I'm like, you know, the only line we knew back then, this was 1982. So the only line we knew back then is, if you were to die today, where would you go? That was like, that was the standard, let me tell you about Jesus line. <laughs> it was like shock and awe, right? So I'm like, I'm like, Dennis, so if you die tonight, where would you go? And Dennis is like looking around like, you know, is this a threat? Is that, you know, is something going on? And, and he said, he said, dude, I just, Give him confession. You know, uh, I should be okay, right? And I, I said, well, I don't know. Like, between you and God, and he said, oh, man. And now I started feeling guilt, right? Like, I just told my sins, but maybe I didn't tell all my sins, and maybe there's a part of me. And so it kind of conflicted him a bit. And, um, and I didn't know where to go from there. I just knew that opening line. If you were to die today, where would you go? Nobody taught me what to say after. <laughs> And so Dennis was like, okay, now you got me thinking. So what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, I'm thinking, I don't know. And so I just say, oh, you know, please go home tonight, talk to God, and say a prayer, whatever. And, and, and so he did. And then the next day we saw each other. He's like, okay, I, I think I met God last night. And, 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 you know, that's where it started. It was very awkward. It was very weird. I, I never went through a seminar on how to preach the gospel. I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to say. All I knew is that I, I needed to share you know, what I experienced. And, and so through the years, you know, we, we grew together in church and in fellowship. And sometimes you might feel that you're, you're there where I was. You know, like, I'm not a pastor. I'm, you know, I haven't been in this thing for too long and what do I say? I know I have to share the gospel. I, I know people need to know but but surely there's other more qualified people out there but doesn't it surprise you that often God opens doors for you and if God opens doors for you doesn't, doesn't he trust you enough that you are more than able to be the person that that person, that friend, that office mate, that classmate is the one who needed to hear. Because if God did not trust you, he would have sent somebody else to talk to your office mate, to your neighbor, to your friend. But he brought that person to you. Because all of us have that responsibility to share good news. And it is good news, isn't it? We like to share good news. We eat in a great restaurant, that's the first thing we do. We call someone we love and say, oh man, you gotta check out this place. We have something else. If you watch a really good movie, what do you, what do you say? Oh, you know, I don't want to spoil it for you, but man, you got to check out this movie, man. You can't miss this. We're, we're always excited to talk about good things that happen in our lives, isn't it? And so how, the question really is, how, how good is the gospel to you? How good is it? Is it good enough to share? That's, that's a question we're going to struggle with today. Is it so good in your life that it's good enough to share? So the question is, the person who, if the person who went out of his or her way to share the gospel to you did not hesitate, and, and what are some reasons 
we can use to remind ourselves that neither should we hesitate to share as God gives us the opportunity. Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, the number one reason why we ought to share the good news is that it is tied to the primary purpose of the church. It is tied to the primary purpose of the church. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gathered his apostles and his disciples. And in Matthew 28, 18, he said, All authority in heaven is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you, if you think about it, people don't waste their final words, do they? You know, if you've ever, if you've ever sat by, uh, by a person who's breathing their, about to breathe their last breath, and I've, I've sat next to many deathbeds in my lifetime, People will choose their words, and they are very careful what they say. People who are about to say things for the last time don't waste what they say. You know, you're, if you've ever, if your mom is passing away and she's breathing her last, she's never going to say, "Hoy ang labada." <laughs> hey, don't forget the laundry. That's not what your mom's going to say, right? Your mom's going to say something like. You know, be kind to your brothers and sisters. Take care of one another. They will say something important. And so when you think about it, this is just about the last thing Jesus said to them. And he did not say, hey, you're a church, so make sure that someday, a couple hundred years from now, you, re you really build nice buildings, okay? He didn't say, make sure that, you know, whenever you gather, the music is like, like really spot on. He didn't say a lot of things about the things that we sometimes consider important in what it means to be a church. Instead, he gave us just one directive. He says, whatever you do, don't forget to make disciples. Because no matter what a church does, if it's not making disciples, it's not fulfilling its primary purpose. And one of the saddest realities is that in the modern world, the church is sometimes the one organization that has forgotten its primary purpose. What is the primary purpose of an airline? It's to transport people safely from here to there. They know that. And everything an airline does is all about safely transporting people. They may have multiple departments. They, have, they may, you know, kind of contract with other companies for other things. But in the end, it's about taking passengers from here to there and make sure they're safe. That's, that's their primary purpose. If you're a, a coffee company, in, in the end, it's about making sure that you can hand somebody a cup of really good coffee. It doesn't matter what else. All, everything else is like extra. The mints and the CDs and the flower arrangements, those are good, but in the end, it's really about the coffee, isn't it? If you're a coffee company, then you, your primary purpose is to provide the customer with a satisfying coffee experience. If you do everything well but don't do that, you will survive as a company. And so isn't it a surprise that sometimes churches are not clear on what we ought to do? Yeah. What should we do as a church? Or we should have really good music, like excellent music, and that's good. How we, our chairs need to be comfortable. It, it, it's got our, our ambiance. <laughs> our ambiance needs to be you know, nice, you know, clean bathrooms, good parking. All of that is cool, and all of that's okay. You know, we got to pay our pastor properly. That's, that's very good. Taking care of us, taking care of one another. But if we do all of that, but don't make disciples, then we've We've lost our primary purpose, haven't we? We're doing everything else. By where we live in, in Fremont, there's a church about maybe two miles down one street. And if you ask people in my neighborhood what goes on in that church, most people who know that church go, oh, that, that's for Tuesday night bingo. <laughs> no kidding. That is the reputation that this church has developed in that community. 
This is the place you go to every Tuesday night for bingo. Is that a bad thing? No, bingo is, if you're into it, I guess it's fun. It's, it's very social, so it, it meets a need. You know, people enjoy themselves. You raise funds for projects. So it's not that they're known for something bad, but they're not known for what the church ought to be focused on. And I wonder what happens when you ask this neighborhood and say, hey, you know that church by Adobe Drive? What's that all about? What are we known for? What, what, what sense do we bring to this community, if not this? That our witness in this community is tied to this idea that we are to make disciples, we are to share the gospel, going to all the world, preach the gospel. And so it's tied to our identity. You know, there's an old, old cartoon, Charlie Brown, I love Charlie Brown. There's an old, old Charlie Brown cartoon where in the first frame, you know, he shoots an arrow, Second frame, the arrow hits a fence. The third frame, he walks to the fence and he takes a, a piece of chalk and he draws a circle around where the arrow landed. And then he's like, bullseye. You know, that's how most of us live, right? We just shoot arrows. We don't know where. But wherever it lands, we claim, well, that's, that's where I wanted it to land. That's what I was aiming for. But in reality, we were aiming for nothing. And so we do this reverse purpose. We figure, well, whatever I'm doing right now, that's got to be my purpose, right? It's like, it's like driving with no directions, no map, and no mind for what freeway you enter, and just convincing yourself that you're on the right track. But in reality, you should always start with a destination in mind, shouldn't you? That every time you go on a journey, you have to be clear on what the end of this journey looks like. And if we're going to be a church, then we need to understand why we are one. And I love the fellowship, and I love the time we eat together in the parking lot, and I love the time we, we hang out, and I love the times that we bowl. But the bigger question we need to ask ourselves is, are we making disciples? Are we preaching the gospel to where disciples are being produced? Because that's the primary purpose. And you take that out, then there's nothing very special about us. A second reason why we ought to share the gospel is, is the reason for which God has given us his spirit. In the shortly after the Great Commission passage, and you read Acts, and by the way, I've said this many times, when you read the gospel of Luke, you have to read Acts immediately after. Because they're essentially one book, two volumes. And, and you know my beef with the Bible, right? Somebody put John in the middle of Luke and Acts and kind of messed that whole system. So John needs to be where? Where does John need to be? John needs to be the beginning of the New Testament. So that Luke and Acts come together. And so even though that's not how our Bible is put together, whenever you read Luke, I want you to read Acts immediately after it. It's one story. And so the gospel ends with Jesus telling them to make disciples. And it kind of picks up in Acts where he says a few final words before he ascends into heaven. And so in, in, in the beginning of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, a lot of us read the first part of that passage, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we're like, that's awesome, that's great. I'll receive the Holy Spirit and I will be powerful. But we never stop to think, we are made powerful for what? For what reason am I given this power? Is it, is it for personal Gain? Is it so I might achieve the fullness of who I am? Is it so that I can meet my goals and, and, and my dreams and aspirations? Is that why God makes me powerful? And forget that the answer is just the next line. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? 
So the reason you are given the Holy Spirit is so that you might be empowered to be a witness for Jesus. It doesn't seem to mean you're always talking about Jesus. The, the whole, whole witness word is, is about a way of life. The word witness, I've shared to you many times, is the word marturia, marturia, which means martyr. And it simply implies that, that the way you are a witness is by the giving of your life, the surrender of your life, the, the martyrdom of your existence. That from now on, the reason you exist, the reason for your life, is to be empowered as a witness for Jesus. And there's almost like a, a ripple effect from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. There's that idea that this keeps, this keeps going and going and going. And so how, how sad it would be to be given such power and not do the things for which you are empowered. I don't know if you, any of you have ever seen this, um, this video clip. It's been around for a while where this lady wants to keep an open line of communication with her elderly father, so you know, she sends him a, an iPad. And the iPad would be a very convenient way to you know, FaceTime and message and stuff like that. And so after a while, she actually goes visit, and she visits him in his house, and they're chatting, and they're preparing a salad, and they're talking around the kitchen, and, and the lady's like, hey, Dad, did you, did you like that gift I sent you? And he goes, yeah, yeah, it was, it was very, very nice, you know, very, and they're talking and preparing dinner, and goes, well, how would you like it? Does it work? He goes, yeah, it, it, it works all right. And there's a woman who prepares a bowl for the salad. The man's chopping a couple of things. And, and then he pours the things he chops into the salad. And lo and behold, he's holding an iPad. <laughs> using it as a chopping board. And the daughter's like... She gave him an iPad. In hopes that he would use it to communicate with her. And he figured out it was just a fancy chopping board. <laughs> That's what happens, isn't it, when you're given something powerful, but you don't know for which it is given. You don't know, you don't know the reason for which it is given. You know, my fear for the future is that we don't, we don't print much anymore. You know, everything's like electronic, everything's like on screen. Do you know that we know what cavemen wrote thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago because their stuff is still on rocks. But thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years from now, humans will discover USB drives, CDs. And they, well, what do they do with that? You know, you, you, a thumb drive, a USB drive, it can have a, gil a, a gazillion pictures, it can have a hundred books, it can have this, that, and, and maybe the people of the future will just use it to, you know, open a Coke bottle. <laughs> not knowing what's in it, not knowing the power that is in it, because they don't know how to access what's inside. Or they might find a CD and it's got, it's got the entire Encyclopedia Britannica in it. And so they'd have access to all that knowledge, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't know what, what to do to extract that. They wouldn't even know that knowledge is in there, so they, they might use it as a coffee coaster. When you don't know what, what something is created for and why it is given, you, you waste the purpose for which it is given, isn't it? And how many believers today are wasting the gift of the Holy Spirit in their lives? And God has filled us with His Spirit. And we have a power within us that the world is, is longing for. And some people would pay big money to even have this kind of power. Remember Simon the Sorcerer in the book of Acts? He did sorcery for a living. But when he saw what Peter did by the power of the Spirit, Simon said to Peter, how much for that? I'll pay you for that. He said, I've never seen that. I do this for a living. I do sorcery for a living, but I've never seen power like that. How much will you give me? Or should I give you for that? And Peter had to rebuke him. This is not the stuff you buy. And yet that's a very power we have. 
And Jesus, then he reminded us that when the opportunity comes, we should never worry and we should never fear what we are going to say to people when we have an opportunity to share the gospel. Because Jesus said, for at that moment, the Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what to say. You will be filled with power and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Sometimes we're intimidated. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we, don't, sometimes we feel we have no right to speak to people given where we are. You know, when I think back of when I first started pastoring this church, I was 23 years old. That, by the way, blows my mind how some of you were willing to listen to me at 23. Because I don't know how many 23-year-olds I'm willing to listen to right now. <laughs> no offense to you. But I got a call to do a wedding, went to the city, did a wedding. 23 years old, I came right out of seminary. I did the wedding, they put me in a table, it was a table just for four. And so next to me was, at that time, a man by the name of Ernie Masetti, he was the president of the Philippine Senate. I'm 23, the Senate president is next to me. Across me is the father of the groom, uh, circuit judge of Makati Court. And then next to me was the father of the bride, uh, one, of the, the most, one of the most wealthy fabric magnets in the Philippines. And I'm 23 years old. I'm trying to get a church started. And I'm listening to their conversation and I'm going, oh my Lord, I shouldn't be here. You know, talking about justice and law and business and economics and and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, <laughs> and I do what they say. I'm just a doofus out of seminary. Like, these are men of the world. These are people who run nations and businesses and enterprise and get people up, put people in Jameson. And so, Mr. Masena looks to me and he says, Pastor Ed, tell us what you do. I don't want to say, well, right now I'm just eating. <laughs> Carry on. And so they all looked at me, and I just, I just started talking. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what I was saying. But for some reason, I just started to speak the very real issues that they were going through. And they just, they just started listening to me. 23. And I started talking, I was looking at their faces and the way they were responding to me, it seemed like I was making sense. I wasn't making sense to me. <laughs> and I remember at the end of that conversation, they, they all said, you know, we're, we're so glad you sat with us today. We, we really learned a lot. I walked away from that and I go, I don't even know what happened there. I don't know. I don't know what I said. I didn't know why I said it. But, but I just remember that. that you, when the opportunity comes, the Holy Spirit will tell you at that time what you need to say. It's very interesting because if I was in the Philippines, I would never have had an audience with this crowd. And God put me there. And many of you find yourselves in places and you go, I know people around here need to hear the gospel. I know this person needs God. I just don't know what to do. And God reminds us that is the reason for which you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not so that you can speak in fancy words and tongues and sing really good songs. But you, you might be witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? The final reason why we need to share is because it is the door that it really opens redemptive power to the world. Remember what Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save everyone who believes. It is the power of God to save everyone who believes. The founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, A.B. Simpson, described the gospel this way. He said, the gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty may be revoked, 
The condemnation of the sinner is canceled. The curse of the law is blotted out. The gates of hell are closed. The portals of heaven are open. The power of sin is subdued. The guilty conscience is healed. The broken heart is comforted. And the sorrow and the misery of the fall is undone. Why would we not want to let people know about this? That's good news, isn't it? Why would we not want anyone to know about this? How good is it to you? How good is it to me? I told people for the last week to go watch Avengers. I said, it's good. And by the way, this shocked a lot of my friends. I said, it's better than Star Wars. Some people thought I was sick. <laughs> I told my friends, go see this. It is much better than the last couple of Star Wars movies because the last couple of Star Wars movies were junk. <laughs> they really were. Marvel's really got a handle on this whole thing. If I was so excited to tell people that they need to watch The Avengers, because remember what happens to Iron Man when <laughs> Some of you haven't seen it yet. I think this is better news, isn't it? What is this? Gates of hell are closed, the portals of heaven are open, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed. Who doesn't want that? Remember what we read earlier? How will people know if no one will tell them? How will anyone tell them if no one is called? The Bible says how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. So my prayer for you this morning is very simple. I want everyone in this church to have beautiful feet. And beautiful feet has nothing to do with the condition of your, the skin in your feet. It has nothing to do with what your toenails look like. It's nothing to do with how rough or how smooth your feet is. You know, you know why it's beautiful feet? Because it takes you to places where people need to know. That's beautiful feet. And I want God this week to use your feet. I want you to look at your feet right now. Look at your, don't look at me, look at your feet. Look at your feet. And I want you to believe with me that God will take those feet to places where people need to hear something good. God's going to take those feet to someone who is desperate. You never know you are going to be taken to a place where someone's just thinking of just ending it all that day. And your feet will take you to that person by the grace of God. God's going to use your feet this week to bring you to someone who has just heard devastating news and they don't know where to go or who to talk to. And God will use your feet to take you to that person. God is going to take your feet to places you have never dreamed or imagined. And your feet will be called beautiful because it is tied to a heart and a mouth that is willing to share good news to people. What do you say? What should you explain? How should you say it? Jesus said, don't worry about that. Just be so filled with the Spirit so that at that moment, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. And it will be the right words. Because they're not going to be your words. It's going to be God's word unto them through you. How many of you, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, are willing to say, I am willing for God to take my feet wherever he wants it to go. And let us pray together. God, I'm grateful for the feet of those that have brought the gospel to me. I'm thankful that someone overcame their fear and their apprehension and brought the gospel message to me. Because here I am full and blessed and forgiven and redeemed. 
only because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now this gospel that I hold dearly in my heart and in my head will carry with me in my arms. I say to you today, I am willing, Lord, to be used by you to bring good news to people that need to hear. And so, Lord, would you direct my feet, whether my feet will take me to places that are familiar, my school, my workplace, my neighborhood, or even if my feet have to go to unfamiliar territory today, or the days to come, an out-of-the-way place, an unfamiliar place. But if that's where you take my feet, then I ask me that you so, so fill me with the Spirit so that at that moment I do not need to worry nor fear what to say. But your Spirit in me will teach me what to say. And they will be words of life. And they will be words of comfort. And they will be words of healing. And they will be words of joy. And they will be words of light in darkness. And I pray, God, that if it is your will, use me greatly. Use me mightily. Use me often. That the gospel might be known by as many people that can hear. This is my prayer this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you stand to your feet? I want you to really believe with me that your feet is going to take you places this week. I don't know where you're going to end up. Like I said, you might end up in familiar places. But for some of you, you're going to end up in places and you're going, what am I doing here? Why did I show up here? Why, why did I end up here? And I want you to remember this day that God has ordained those feet to take you where you are. And that is an opportunity to share the love of Christ. Looking forward to your stories. Looking forward to lives that will be changed because you obey. I'm looking forward to fellowshipping with you again next week. Thank you so much for gathering here today. Last week I asked you to meet a couple of people that maybe you don't know by name. Maybe today you can meet one or two more. Uh, and say, hi, my name is so-and-so, uh, and, -so, and I've never officially met. And I'm not going to stop reminding you to do this until everyone in this church knows one another. Because we're too small a church to not know who's seated on the other side. Amen? God bless you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. As we sing this final song, let's just honor God once again. Before you step out of your seats, get to greet one another, get to know one another, and then march your feet out of this place because there's a world out there that really needs to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you all, and be a blessing.